I always lean on that scripture because it is the kindness of God that leads our kids to repentance, to just be in the midst of your presence. I know um, I've had kids that were prodigals, and I have prayed and prayed and prayed. In fact, I prayed so much and cried so much and went to the foot of my bed and cried so much that I heard the Lord speak to me and say, Linda, you've cried at the side of your bed. Now it's time to start prophesying and declaring their future. Because we have the authority to do that. We can shift them right where they need to be by declaring and prophesying. So what does that look like? Aaron, you're going to be a great man of God. Aaron, I call the presence of the Lord upon you. One day you will turn around and you will serve him with your whole heart. I declare it. I prophesy the goodness of the Lord upon you right now in Jesus' name. I declare your ears and your eyes will be open to the Holy Spirit. And I pray that God will pray, bring di divine appointments in your life. And you just start to war like that. You just start to speak the heart of the Father over their lives. It's really, really important. And I know for prodigals, um, one of the things is, you know, you can't keep on telling your kids, you need to find Jesus. You need to get into church. Why do you talk like that? You're, you know, you can't keep doing that because what it is, it becomes, I'll give it to you, it comes a, you become a nag. And what it does is it pushes them even further. And I always was uh, taught this, you know, when you turn a light switch on and off, the light goes on, the light goes off. You don't hear anything, do you? Right? So you go in that room or whenever you're with your children, you just love them. You kill them with kindness, really. And you just be that light with any unspoken words. It's the love of a mother, the love of a father, the love of the Lord Jesus Christ that's going to lead them to repentance. The only thing I was going to say is we declare your voice, your words are powerful. You declare and you decree that they will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when they come back. And I believe that your faith, you have to believe it. You, ha you have to have your faith. Anybody else want to respond to this? And my, my daughter, at 19 years old, ran away from home. I didn't know where she was at for two weeks. So then when we found out where she was at, she would, and when we found out she was in California, we did, we're in North Carolina. So when we found out she was in California, um, we didn't know where she was staying at. So in the Word, in Isaiah 54, it says that God will teach your children. All right? But it's up to us to pull on the Word of God. And to put a demand on that word. So I began to demand that, God, you're going to teach her wherever she's at. And I began, uh, we found out where she was at. We got in contact with her. But for three years, we could not ask her to come home. We couldn't ask her where she was at, what she was doing, or to come home. Because anytime we would say, where are you at, what are you doing, I need you to come home. But God supernaturally showed us where she was at. And, and in those three years... My, my husband texts her every single day, good morning, sunshine, I love you. Every single day, good morning, sunshine, I love you. So she came home during COVID. And during COVID, we still couldn't tell her, you know, but she met a guy. So she met a guy. And so one day she came to me. She said, Mama, I'm coming home. And she said, I got something to tell you. She said, I, she, she started to say, she said, you are, I said, stop. I don't need to hear it. Don't need to hear it. I don't want to even hear it out of your mouth. I pray for you. God brought you home. I, and she was going to tell me I was right. I didn't need to hear it. All I needed her was to be home. And let me tell you something. She's been home over three years, and we are closer than we've ever been. And let me tell you, 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 when you start warring for them kids and you understand that's your seed, that's your seed. God said that your children are an inheritance from the Lord. And so when you begin to tell, you can't have my kids, they're mine. God gave them to me. And so when you begin to decree and declare, and God said, you're going to teach my children. So I don't have to teach her anything. I just got to release her to the Lord. And he taught her. He brought her home. Um, how do you forgive when the offender keeps the same behavior? So it's not, it's not on you about their behavior. But it is on you, as we learned today, to make a choice. You have to choose each day, you may have to say it 50 times, 100 times, Lord, I have forgiven them. I have forgiven them. I choose to forgive and release. I choose to forgive and release. And God will honor that. And after a while, he will deal with them. You don't have to. You don't have to try to change them. You don't have to try to uh, be the judge there, um, be the, the correctional officer. You just need to do your part. And then God will we'll team up with you. When we think about it in this walk, this kingdom walk, we are partnering with God. 
We are the authority in the earth. He has given us that. So we have to remember what we speak out of our mouths. Begin to speak just what they just said. You know, begin to speak over them and change your atmosphere, change your circumstance. Amen? Amen. Amen. Um, it says um, financial. How do you build a business, get rid of debt, have financial freedom? And the other question is how to be financially stable. Okay, when you live in the kingdom, which I'm going to teach you about later, you have to understand how the kingdom operates. But one thing that I see Christians do all the time is you will plan out your bills and your budget to a T. I'm going to pay this, and I'm going to pay that, and then I'm going to pay that. But when it comes to the kingdom, you just give willy-nilly. You, uh, what's the tenth? Let me see. Well, I didn't go to church this week, so I'm not going to give tithes this week. I'm probably going to give tithes next week. And uh, an offering, oh, well, well, hold on. Let me see what I got in my pocketbook. I got $2. I'm going to give $2 in an offering, right? And yet it's the thing that God says. He says those that give to the poor lack nothing. And yet your giving is tied to your finances. And the tithe, he says, test me, prove me. He says he's going to rebuke the devourer on your behalf. What is that? Your children. You want your children to come in? Start giving. You have to give your way out of poverty. But let me ask you all a question. Who would love to be a millionaire this year? Like really, seriously. If you would love to be, raise your hand. I'm serious. I'm serious. If you would love to be a millionaire. Every, right, right. Okay, now this is the other problem that I find. How many of you ask God for a million dollars? Right? Seriously. Said, God, give me a million dollars. Do you know why you don't ask? Because you think it's up to you. And so you get the house. Well, how are we going to make that happen? I'm, I want a house, God, but how, I ain't going to ask God for a house because how am I going to make the house payments? I'm not going to ask God for a car because how am I going to make the car payments, right? And so we get the howies. How we, how we? And God says, no, you live in an economy that's heaven's economy. That means it's depression proof, it's recession proof. It means the banks can shut down, but not your household, right? When you could not buy toilet paper, I had a knock on my door and said, do y'all need some toilet paper because we got some for you. That's provision. That's supernatural wealth. If you understand living in the kingdom, that you, you serve the king of all kings, the Lord of all lords. So if you are in $45,000 worth of credit card debt, if you don't ask God to pay it, one year from now, 10 years from now, you're still going to be in debt. But when you begin to ask the Lord, God, I need you to pay off this debt, he don't care. He don't care what you owe. He doesn't care. But we are scared to death of debt, so we won't even add it up. I mean, I, I know people that have had credit card debt. I said add it up. They're like, ooh, I get a panic attack if I add it up. I, ooh, my husband's going to kill me if I add up that debt. My husband's going to kill me, right? <laughs> but how's God going to pay it off if you never ask him? I've seen people that are, I've worked with people that are financially free. God's give them houses. Give them them houses. Then it cost them a dime. This one lady, um, and, and then I'll pass it on. But this one lady that, uh, one of my good friends, she was going through a divorce. And her husband, ex-husband, took her to the Supreme Court of Mississippi. The Supreme Court in a divorce. Who does that, right? So she, her car broke down, and she's walking home one day. And she said, she said, Teresa, teach me how to do this. So I taught her how to, how to do planned giving. How do you plan your tithe? How do you plan your offering? How do you plan your seed? Because all of three of them are different. Your tithe opens the windows of heaven, rebukes the devour on your behalf. The offering opens, it keeps that, of, of that uh, perpetual flow. So you become a funnel and not a barrel. Then your seed hits a target. So if you want something to happen, you plant a seed. Okay, so we give willy-nilly, not expecting anything to happen. So I said, okay, here's what you're going to do. We're gonna, we're gonna, you're going to sow a seed. Ask the Holy Spirit where to sow it to. And the other thing is, oh, you think you've got to dig deep, get out your credit card to sow a seed. It's the law of multiplication. He said, I give seed to the sower and multiply it. I give seed to the sower and I multiply it. So then... I told her, I said, get your seed out, let's, let's sow your seed, and we're going to sow a seed for a car. And I told her, I said, okay, by November, you're going to have a car backed up into your driveway. She rented a car, was walking home because she's only a couple of blocks. She said it was hot as blue blazes. Her ex-husband sees her walking, has a car delivered to her door, backed up, the one taking her to the Supreme Court, right? Because it says that, you're, that God will raise up your enemies to bless you, right? <laughs> yes. 
she, she didn't even have to put tags on the car. He paid for the tags. All she had to do was put insurance on it. And I'm telling you, once you understand that's how the kingdom operates, you, you will be, look, you, you go through the roof. You will just go, you're like, oh my, this is amazing. This is amazing. And so this was a great question for me because I was bound in fear when I came to the Lord in my early 20s. My life had become so small. It was getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And so when I got saved, I had an immediate deliverance because God can deliver in several different ways. But what he has taught me is that you have got to take fear off the throne of your life and put God up there. Because some of us are totally living under the power of fear. It tells us what to do. It tells us what we can say, what we can't say, where we can go, what we're allowed. We're a slave to fear. Like it really has become, a, it can become a dominating spirit in your life. And so one time when the Lord, he broke chains, it's like chain after chain after chain. You know, you're walking this thing out in faith. And the Lord started working on me, and I had a huge fear of flying, and so I would never fly. I wouldn't go on vacation. My husband wanted to go to Hawaii. I was like, nope. not. I know, that's crazy now. I would, I would love to go now, right? But I was so terrified of flying, it wasn't even an option in my life. So tr any type of traveling beyond, like, California, because I don't like being in the car that long, was out for me. Like, I didn't even think about it. And that's how our mindsets get so shrunken down from fear and so I got I saw a conference it was about deliverance and he was proclaiming it it was the year of deliverance I saw the ad I knew that I was going to get deliverance if I went to this conference I didn't know what for and it turned out to be several different things but I had to fly to go to this conference and that was a huge fear of mine and the conference date that I was going to take my very first flight was 9-11 not the 9-11, but it was 9-11. So, of course, on the, at the airport on 9-11, thinking about the radio stations commemorating as they should, but all this stuff, my husband wanted to talk about it. I'm like, no. <laughs> you know, but I was sick to my stomach. I wanted to cancel it, but I knew the Lord had something for me if I would go to this conference. So I push myself. I go. I get on the plane. I'm like crying silent tears. They're just leaking out of my face. And I sit on that plane and I begin to frantically pray. And I put music in my ears. And I'm frantically play, praying. And I heard the Lord speak to me so clearly. And he said, you can pray in faith or you can continue to fear. But you cannot have both. So you need to make a choice. Either you're going to have faith or you're going to pray and leave it in my hands. Because I was praying, but I was in fear praying. I'm praying the same thing over and over. God, please protect me, God. No, no, no. Like, I really thought that the Lord was going to lure me out to my death by this aircraft because I thought I was going to get deliverance, right? So it's like trusting God, having faith. Like Jess said, put your money where your mouth is. Sometimes we have to put our faith where our mouth is because it's easy to say, and at church it's easy to be a woman of great faith, but in our lives, in our daily activities is where that faith is tested. It comes down to the choice. Who do I believe at this moment? Who am I going to trust? Am I going to trust God? Am I going to trust myself? Or am I going to cower down to fear? So it's just dethroning fear. When that voice of fear is talking, you pray in faith and then you leave it there. I like to imagine an altar sometimes. I'm leaving it at the altar. I'm walking away. I'm not taking it with me still scared. I'm choosing at that point to trust in God. 